Welcome to the Rex Chapman Show with my buddy Josh Hopkins, powered by Hello. Basketball News. Uh, it's episode five. Josh, guess what? We have KD today. No way. Yes, we have KD. KD? Yeah, out on the heels of Shaq. We got KD. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, world renowned, been a success at every spot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, just. Uh, unbelievable body of work so kd sure. you know Dang. coming in like this it's big for us right for sure yeah uh, getting kd lang is a big get a real a, a big podcast. get yeah. yes i mean i'm looking just, forward to uh, getting me too I, I i can't wait to talk um what's been going on buddy you're back in texas i see i am i am yeah. you are you're still i'm in lexington. still in lexington yeah all right yeah. all right uh well what's happened this week in sports. Hmm? Well, How about I have I have something I want to ask you about. What? A couple weeks ago, I asked you if you had to pick one team in the NBA to win it. If you had to, then you said the Nets. How do you feel yeah. about that now? They've, they've had some struggles lately. Yeah, I still think they're going to win it. Um, I'm a little biased, but uh, I do. They haven't had their three guys together really at all. KD's still coming back. Uh, he's been out quite a while with that hamstring injury. Uh, right. James is out. <laughs> James is out right now with the hammy. And uh, uh, Kyrie's been in and out. And that's a little frustrating, I think. Uh, it's, I know it's frustrating for fans. Uh, I really – I know he's expecting a baby uh, sometime around now. I don't know if that has something to do with him missing time. The only one that I – I was frustrated watching him the other night. And I love Kyrie. I think he's he's arguably the greatest one-on-one -on -one player to ever pick up a basketball, given the rules of today, where you can't touch a person. Right. right. He well is, said. It, he's he's amazing. But he got kicked out of a game the other night. He got frustrated because uh, Dennis Schroeder called him a name, and uh -huh. he took offense to it. And they both got tossed. Now, look, if you want to do that, and that's fine. I got kicked out of plenty of games. Uh, <laughs> the game's got to be decided already. I mean, you can't, you, you can't lose your mind, especially when you're the only guy out there right now. KD's still coming back. They're playing the Lakers right. in this game. <laughs> They're playing the Lakers in this game, and he got tossed. Now, you just got to gotta fight through that moment, right. my opinion, if you're him. And do this for your teammates. Get into that later on. But uh, yeah. anyway, great player. Well, so it's frustrating, still, I know. You still got the Nets. You're sticking with I them. I still have the Nets. All right. Um, oh, I want to ask you about – we've talked about Zion before, but he's yeah. seemingly taken another uh, level up. <laughs> what do you say about that? When I watch him right now, um, the thing that stands out to me is his conditioning. At, we've never seen him uh, in the at the level of conditioning uh, condition that he's in right now. I don't think. I mean, he's for as big as he is, he's just ripped. He can run all day. He can get it off the board. You know, he used to only be able to play in short spurts, especially right when he right. even when he came into the league. Um, right. You know, he was just so much better in college. It didn't look like it was that taxing for him. But I think he's got his conditioning down now. He's obviously doing something right with his diet because he's he, he's a machine he's you know he's on possibly the hottest tear of all one of the hottest tears of all time i mean I he just on. had 38 on like 16 of 22 shooting like uh, and that's insane. like commonplace for him now that the numbers have we ever seen anything like it i know you said draymond ish in the way he can he can handle the ball and distribute but he's obviously a freak athlete when he came out, I, I did. I, I thought he was going to be sort of like Draymond on steroids. You know, right. uh, that sounds stupid. But anyway, <laughs> just just with more bounce, more athleticism. Um, and I, honestly, at some point, and maybe already a better shooter. Um, he's he's going to continue to learn to make shots. I mean, we saw Rondo come in the league, couldn't shoot. Jason Kidd, all these guys. Michael came in, couldn't shoot. He's going to be able to shoot the ball. Lonzo Ball came in, couldn't shoot, can shoot now. Um, he, yeah, he's he's insanely good. I, I, they're also decided to 
put him at point at times. Love it. Kind of just run the offense through him. Amazing that the guy has that also awareness. He's got know, that the, vision, you know, yeah, the, and the, the, the biggest advantage he has is, you know, especially in this day and age where you can't hand check, you can't touch. If he's coming at you with any sort of head of steam, you just have to guess right. If you don't guess right he, he, and he runs over you, you're going to get a charge called. But if you don't guess, guess right, he's just going to the rack and he elevates so quick, so fast that, you know, he's into your body before you even know it. I mean, he's insane, the bounce he has. I know. And, and, and just that big and strong, but his first step, boom. I know he, he just ices, he ices bigger guys out on the floor. He ices smaller guys out on the floor and he's just past them. And you can kind of see the guy in that moment going, damn, I didn't know he was that fast. <laughs> right. Oh, shit, what was oh that? I got a question for you. I want to know, yeah. did you see the mile bridges dunk? Miles bridges. Oh my goodness. Yes. Uh, uh, Del Del Curry and Eric Reed on the call for the Hornets were, were the bomb too. They went Uh, lost their minds. I think they're Del Curry, good friend of mine. That's right. That's right. You and (laughs) Del. Um, yeah, but, uh, that, what, what a dunk, what a dunker and his games come around. I mean, I know he's playing, playing better this year, but I think a lot of it has to do with Lonzo early on in this, on the season, getting him easy buckets, lob dunks. I mean, Lonzo, or not Lonzo, uh, LaMelo. I misspoke. Yeah, yeah, LaMelo. Lamello, sure. uh, there's too many ball, too many balls in the league. <laughs> that didn't sound right either. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> this is taking um, a turn. But still not the – I contend that the Anthony Edwards dunk is still the dunk of the year. No, yeah. They both got agree. good dunks, good jumps. You right. Know, a little, little more elevation. Uh, yeah, Anthony Anthony Edwards. That ball just hit the ground so hard and so fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just watched the uh, um, uh, Anthony Edwards dunk just today earlier because that's the kind of thing I have to do. Yeah, uh, yeah, you're busy. He just rode the guy down like a Bronco. <laughs> he would dunk, and then he was kind of like, oh, <laughs> rolled him down. And my favorite part of the video is when he walks – away from that and he looks up smiling at the teletron the he wants to see it he's of like course. oh i gotta see this <laughs> i love that kid. It's so great i do too the interviews he's fun are great. too yeah he yeah. is he is yeah you know i like um, the, i like the young kids now i mean the guys coming in Lamelo got a lot of personality you know likes to yeah. play and the other yeah. thing about those two young guys they're both teenagers i guess they're not afraid to come in and show their enthusiasm and be rah rah right. and kind of corny. You got to do that as a pro athlete just to get yourself up for games sometimes. But they come by it genuinely. It's fun to watch. Yeah, I know. I'm I'm missing Mello. Uh, book report. Finally, we oh. get to the book report this right. week. Stuff we're reading. It's a, good, it's a good, segment good. we do each week. Just stuff we're reading that we think people might be interested in. Hopefully, you have something. Well. Um, Oh man, you know, the weather has gotten really good here. Uh, the last few days here in Lexington, I know you left and went back to Texas. And so I've been trying to get out a little bit. I played some golf and, uh, Uh gotten back in the pool outside. So I, I didn't get to, I I didn't get nothing this week, nothing this week. What about you, bud? Depending on you because I traveled and I was, (sighs) you know, mixed up a lot of trouble traveling I then uh, got back here and then I was hungry and stuff. So I don't so really nothing, have anything. Mm-mm. Nothing for you. Okay. Well, well, that's been book we'll report get... for this week. Um, how about we just talk about our fan? Who is our fantastic guest again today? Lang. And when I, and when I say, what did you say? Lang. 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 Yes. Yeah. Katie Lang. That's yes. who we have, Josh. Yes. Katie yes. Lang. We do have the original Katie, Katie 1.0. That's right. That's right. And how she knows a lot about basketball. Oh. I mean, she, in this interview, she's not pretending. She drops no. nuggets like she knows, and she loves her Portland Trailblazers, right? Oh, bro. I, you know, you know how I get, and I know how you get just, we can get giddy like kids when we're interviewing people that we don't know. I do get excited for the basketball players, of course, 
but I get more excited. I think for people, I have no idea about really Mm -hmm. what they're like as a person. I've watched them on TV or whatever it is over the years and just become a fan off of that. She's one person I was really excited to talk to because she's had such a fascinating life. But then she was even more fascinating than I could have ever imagined. Uh, And the basketball that she knows. And anyway, I I'm, I'm, humbled that she came on the show we could have talked to her for two or three hours right she was amazing so at ease with herself that's you know the thing. kind of in the way Shaq was just kind of easy in her own skin uh just a beautiful soul smart so smart and she has stood up for what she believed in her entire life uh she's I loved talking to her and you're right i could have talked to her for two more hours should we get to katie lang let's get to katie lang one point yeah. our our home our new great friend katie lang yeah. let's get to it yes love it Catherine dawn lang thank yes, you sir. so much for joining us on, on Chapman, it is my absolute pleasure you know it you've kept me entertained and aggravated and enthused for the whole year of COVID. So I thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you for the kind words. Well, you know, it's kind of a basketball podcast, uh, kind of not. uh, But we thought, you know, to kick things off, we wanted to get the original KD on. Yeah, the original, the OG KD. (laughs) (laughs) Because these youngsters are all squabbling over who owns the rights to KD. And it's like, uh... Hate to tell yeah. you, folks. Yeah, that's right. You're the original. Now we're so excited to have you. Thank Iconic. You. This is going to be so much fun. Um, Rex, I know wants to get right into your love of the Blazers to kick I, it off. So, I, but, I, but let me interrupt you for one second. I think I see a Winnipeg Jets T-shirt. Oh, uh, this is just, just, just Canada. Just plain old Canada. I'm not that's- Canadian, but I've worked there a lot, and I wore this for you. Well, I appreciate that. And it did not go unnoticed. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It feels good. It feels really good. good. Oh, my gosh. It's snowing fun. here today. Just FYI. Oof. It's raining. Wow. Snowing. Snowing. Mm-hmm. Wow. <laughs> nice. Very nice. Now, yeah. you're in Calgary now? I am. Yep. Um, okay. So, K- Katie, did, did you know of me before Twitter? No. Fantastic. I didn't. That's so Although, great. I did. Wa- I have watched basketball for a million years and I probably did see you, but, um, you know, I was living in LA at the time. Right. So I was kind of focused on Kobe and Shaq. So, Oh yeah, of course, <laughs> as you would be. Um, so you followed basketball for a long time. You liked it as a sport. From I played what it. I- yep. I played it and I've watched it for many, many years. So you played growing up. High school. Fantastic. Nice. Yeah, so number great. 42, center. <laughs> number so, 42. You, you, you're a big Portland fan. I am, right? yeah. Trailblazers. No, yeah. What do you think of the season so far this year? <sighs> well, we always seem to get racked with injuries. I don't know, but everyone's back. We have Norman Powell now, who's just a, a tremendous shooter. And just a, he's a veteran player that I feel is a super, super smart so he's very basketball intelligent. So I think once we gel, we'll be in good shape for the playoffs. And, you know, now that LA is kind of wavering. Oh, Both this is so yeah. great. I, it, it's so great to hear you talk about basketball. I mean, really. And Norman Powell really is one of my favorite guys. When he was at UCLA, you know, he played and he wasn't, he wasn't highly, he was a second round pick, I believe, ended up being a second round pick he wasn't real highly thought of on his college team even yeah a great athlete I mean bouncy and can guard two or three positions and oh, yeah. found his niche in Toronto it, that's a big pickup and I'm I'm really good friends with Neil O'Shea so are you oh yeah, you know, cool. yeah we go way back can you uh, tell me to get some defensive beast for us please I'm gonna let you tell him because <laughs> when, when the uh once we are all uh, vaccinated and whatnot I plan on coming out and I hope you will meet me there and we'll go meet we'll go meet Neil and then hopefully meet a couple of my stupid Twitter fo- Twitter followers in Dame and CJ 
Oh. I would love to get you with Dame Dollar. Oh man, I, well, I've met Dame and he is just a stellar human being, man. Inside I, out. Oh, special, special being that guy. How did you how did you fall in love with him so much? I mean, I know you like the Blazers and all that, but you have a special affinity for Dame, right? I do. Well, he's a musician, and but I I don't know. There's just something ethereal and spiritual about him that, and just um, also altruistic. He seems so like you know he's out there in the BLM movement, out there protesting on the street with the people, and and it's not for show. It's not demonstration. It's real. It's for real. And I don't know. I just there's something about him, and then just his work ethic and his his ability to rise to the occasion that that shows me that it's coming from the deeper well. I don't know. There's something I'm, in. I'm with you. He, he, there's no, there's no false hustle about Dane no. at all. He's, no, he, he's, he's hurt. He pulls back. And it, at, even, I mean, at, coming from where he came from, wasn't highly recruited, you know, Weber state, and then uh, burst onto the scene, and he's never really gone through that. Well, he's he hasn't gone through that. A lot of even even Stephen, my little Stephen Curry, you know, he wasn't a um, highly sought after kid in high school. Went to college, and then things came to him late, and then he kind of you know blossomed and became more of an entertainer at yeah. times. Yeah, Dame has he's just flatline, you know, almost his yeah. demeanor. He's, he, he acts like he's done everything before. Uh, I, it's just a joy to watch him play. It's true. And the, and what I really, really appreciate about him, because I'm a Portland Trailblazers fan, but I, I think I would appreciate this if he was playing for another team, is his loyalty to the organization. Um, you know, even I am considering a trade to Brooklyn at this point. Um, <laughs> I mean, who isn't going to Brooklyn at this point? It's so boring. I hate team stacking. I hate oh, it. I hate it. I hate it. This is great because now I, I get to tell you that my son is up here. Uh, I'm in New York right now. I've come up to visit him. He's in Brooklyn's video room with my buddy, my good longtime buddy. He's been friends with Steve Nash. So oh. they're right here stacking the team, just stacking your team. Uh, stacking the deck against your team. How do you feel about the super teams? Go into it a little. I don't bit. like it. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's a part. I guess it's a part of it. But you know, it's just hard on cities like Portland. I mean, people just they don't want to live in Portland for some reason. It's an amazing city. It is an amazing city. But uh, you know, the smaller cities they pay the price, even in the the all star voting and all of it. And it, I just wish there was a way to level the playing field. But I mean, that's the nature of our society, isn't it? It's just, it's not level no matter what. Yeah, you know, I found myself taking up yesterday for for the Nets, but I also took up for the for the Warriors and KD when he went there. The rules are the rules now, and they're different. Used to be, you know, if uh, Carl Malone went to the Lakers. It's because you know the team kind of worked out a trade so for he so he could go there late in his career to try, try to win a title. You know, with Lamarcus and Blake, I think that's yeah. probably what they're doing. Also, good players like that didn't used to get bought out. I yeah. mean, it, you know, they were still serviceable at the end of their careers, and you know, nobody wanted to trade them to a a title contender. So yeah. it's it is hard. I know it's hard for the fans. Yeah, it's it's a it's part of the well. Since you're friends with Neil O'Shea, it's, pro, it's, it's <laughs> part of the it's part of the chess game, right? Yeah. It's part of the the higher rankings chess chess game, and it's I don't. It is really hard on the fans. Last night it was brutal watching Gary Trent Jr. and Rodney Hood play on Toronto, and yeah, so frank. <laughs> you no. feel like this, you know? Yeah, you really do. No, it is the good part about, it, especially with Neil and. When you when you have smaller market teams trying to compete with these these big market places, a lot of times it does come down comes down to your players and who they recruit, you know, who their friends are. But it also comes down to your GM, your president. And Neil has relationships with agents going back three, four decades, and he's he's really good on that end of things. So he he has a, a kind of a built in. I don't know, charm about him to, he, 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 he's, he's really good. And I think you guys have a good, good one there. Yeah. Well, 
let's hope in the next couple of years we'll find ourselves in the finals. What's um, how far back do you go watching the Blazers? Well, I moved from Los Angeles to Portland in 2012, which is when Damien got signed and when Terry Stotts ended up there. So I feel like a, a kind of a Portland kinship with those guys. That's awesome. Josh, what do you got? I'm doing all the talking today. Ah, I just love hearing it. I like the basketball stuff because because you're a basketball guy. I'm a big fan too, Katie, but um, I love I don't know near as much as he does. So I love hearing you all talk about it. But one thing I do just want to know, I mean, you are – uh, considered a vocalist of our generation in some ways, like th some of the greats consider you the greatest We're right there. And I want to know what it's like to take a breath, push air out of your lungs through your vocal cords. And it sounds like beautiful music art. Mm. What is, what is that like? It, it, it's phenomenal that I'm going to start with the, the straight up honest answer. It's phenomenal. I guess it, I guess it's the same as anyone who is performing their given talent, like a step back three shot for a Dame. you know, like it's, it's no different. It's, it's the zone. It's your, your essence. It's, it's when you're, I don't, I don't even know how to describe it. It is, it is phenomenal though. I, I, I haven't quite tired of, of that feeling, you know, singing is everything. Um, but you know, like everything, the business and the performance aspect of it, I still sing, you know, I sing to my dog and I sing around the house, but the business wears on you after a while. Sure. In every, in every profession, in, in every yeah. art profession as well. Of course it yeah. does. But just to have that gift, it's just, I mean, and how do you not do it all? If I got on an airplane and could do that, <laughs> I would just be like, eh, excuse me, everyone. Crazy. Crazy. <laughs> I mean, people would be like, oh, my God. Like, how do you not do that all day everywhere you go? Yeah. Um you don't want the attention quite honestly all the understood time. understood yeah. and i and I, lots of times again when i'm walking the dog down by the river or something i'm going to be singing but um yeah i mute myself quite a lot just because I, I don't want the attention um mm -hmm. so you know you you pick and choose your moments i guess Katie, when right. did when did you know that you had this gift and when when did um you, when, when were you recognized by your siblings, by your folks for, for being able to sing? How young? Really young, really, really young. Could um, they? I, I was studying classical piano um, with a, a nun in, and um, I, I, I'm, I'm the worst student. Uh, I have absolutely no capacity for academics. That's true. <laughs> so, hey, you're so, right. Well, you're, you're with family. That's right. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm, among, I'm amongst uh, relatives. Friends, yes. Yeah. Uh, she said, you know, you should try singing. And that was at the age of five. And um, I knew my whole schooling. I, I, I kind of just, I did, I played sports and I, I I didn't care about my marks at all because uh, I knew I, I, and it's, I know it's kind of rare to know, but I did. I always knew what my, my path was. And I feel pretty lucky about that. So that is a matter of that is, hard. That it. is so lucky, but to have a passion and be able to make a life out of yeah. that, it's just a blessing amongst blessings. I, I want to ask you though, say you, you're, Piano teacher, say that didn't even happen. Say you didn't start singing at five. What if, if you had discovered at 18 that you could sing, would, would your voice have been what it is now? Because people think it's just, you're just born with it. And there's a large aspect of that. But singers have to sing. They have to, or it's just like a ball player. If you don't go out and shoot, it, it goes away in some parts. Now you obviously, yeah. just nature, nurture. I, 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 that's a hypothetical I probably can't answer because, you know, um, 
singing, like everything else, is such a culmination of of every aspect of your personality and your spirituality, and and you can, and it's inseparable. You can't dissect it and go, you know, I would have been a great singer, better singer if I did this, or I would have been a worse singer if I didn't, you know, be my sexuality and my spirituality and my upbringing in the prairies and every every little tiny thing um, contributed to who I who I am. And one. Wow. We're happy for all your experiences because uh, <laughs> it's a gift for all of us. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you were you were such a for us. Uh, and at at the time, I, when I go back and think about our ages and whatnot, I I always thought I assumed you know you were way older. You were <laughs> you were. Uh, when I was like in high school, you know, you were just starting to become a, a really, really big deal. And, you know, I didn't think of you as around my age, but you were such a cultural pivot point for us. You came out early. And, you know, when you see people today like Brandy Carlisle, um, do you feel any satisfaction for helping kind of show these show these guys a different way? Because it had to have been hard. Uh, when you decided to do this. I yeah, it was, it was pretty, uh, pretty lonely out there. But yes, I absolutely take a sense of pride in watching the youngsters come out. And, um, but you know, I had my role models too. I had wow. Elton and I had Martina Navratilova and I had people that, um, you know, laid the path down, Billie Jean King and um, his I had people who I looked up to. So it's, I always think of it as, you know, it's a brick in the road. We all have our place and we all have our, 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 our purpose, you know, and in, in creating a foundation for change. Well, at the time, I mean, it was a big risk. You could have lost your career in, in many aspects and it was really hard on there was picketing and, you know, uh, I'm sure you got a lot of hate. There was a lot of everything. In your own hometown, right? Yeah, yeah. but that was more about the vegetarianism. I, yeah. I, I got a lot more flack about but also, not eating burgers. Also, yeah, if Josh and I came out in Kentucky against beef, they, they went off with our heads, I believe. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm with you. Yeah. It just had to take so much guts How how <laughs> and determination. How long? How long? Um, going back to, to, to coming out, how long did you struggle with it before you were like, no, I've got to be honest with myself and, you know. Well, again, I was lucky in that I knew I was gay my whole life. So I was comfortable with who I was from the get go. And um, I'm also from a family who three out of four kids are gay. So um, I'm the youngest, but I came from a culture that somehow cultivated that <laughs> safety net around us. And, um, you know, I came out right when the AIDS crisis was in full yeah. assault. And I really felt like it was the most responsible thing I could do is to come out and live my truth, live, live an authentic truth because homophobia was just ugly and I just felt that it, that society could use somebody just going, and, you know, you know, what's the deal? You know, you know, a lot of gay people, you just haven't recognized it yet. Right. Well, the country, you know, uh, the community of fans isn't the most liberal. And uh, so that was really, really brave of you. How was the, the community like in Nashville and the country community of, of fellow artists, how were they with you when you came out? I, I kind of left right at the same time. I, I switched from country to pop at that time because I made Ingenue and that, that, that was a, a significant shift in genre at that time. So I kind of left country behind at that time, knowing that it would be a rough ride. I never felt fully committed or in, or yeah I just didn't feel committed to country I never considered myself a country singer I considered myself to be a singer sort of like 
somebody like Ray Charles or Linda Ronstadt or somebody that just, you know, or Elvis for that matter, just who sang songs. And sometimes it was country, sometimes it was jazz. And I just didn't, I just felt like the time had come when I had sort of exhausted my welcome and certainly coming out, I didn't, didn't feel like they needed to be pressured and I didn't want to be pressured by the political ramifications of it. You know, uh, Patsy Cline was a big influence for you and she did a lot of the same thing. Was that always your goal to, if this is the genre that accepted you to, you know, defy labels and expand to different, was that always your goal or did you follow her footprints in that way? Because I know you really, really uh, looked up to her. Yeah, no, Patsy Cline sort of was a late influence for me. My early influences were people like Joni Mitchell and Kate Bush and then, you know, some of the jazz singers and, um, then I sort of fell in love with Patsy. So that was a, that was a later influence. It just happened to be the influence that was the strongest at the time I started my career. And I just had a vision for who I was as a country singer, you know, the country punk thing. And it just happened to coincide. Um, but yeah, I never planned on being genre specific ever. And I still, still feel squeamish about being categorized. Do your, did your siblings, do they have, did they get any of the gift and, or they just, are they artists? Uh, yeah, they're, they're definitely artists. I'm the only one, you know, uh, I'm the only professional, but um, my brother, for example, was a um, child classical piano prodigy. He went from uh -oh. nine to university. So that, that had a lot of influence on my ear. Your, your sure. parents were your parents gifted that way? No, um, I, I, from what I remember, my dad was a really good singer. My mom was super diligent at getting us all a um, artistic education. So, wow. like I said, we all studied classical piano, and she had she worked all day and then drove us sixty miles mm -hmm. one way in the Canadian winter to get us piano lessons. So, pretty <laughs> diligent, and I'm very appreciative for her doing that you know i uh i'm sure it sounds it, it just sounds awesome that 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 was nurtured because i know where where i grew up you know rural kentucky you know the arts weren't a big focus um in fact for i don't know for people who played sports they were kind of dissuaded so um yeah just i, I wonder i because i played with a lot of players and and saw different levels of talent did you have to, did, did you have to really work at singing? I mean, did you have, uh, was there a time early in your teens or childhood where you had to, I know you, you started, you said earlier working a little bit with someone, but did you have to really work at the vocal part of it or was it just natural, more natural? I hate to say this. Oh, I, I want you to. It was natural. That's great. But, but I think I, but don't think I didn't put in a lot of work because I did. And I think I did in terms of listening and processing and um, pondering, meditating on, um, because singing is an extension of your soul. So like any thing really but it, it was about um opening up my true self like because I don't think I would be a really good singer if I was trying to conform and do an, a social idea of who I should be I wouldn't sing the same so to me the voice is an extension of the work I've done on the spiritual aspect I'm going to say spiritual but I you know in the broader sense of spirituality um, and then I just, I, I toured, I mean, I, from the time, let's see, when did I start performing? 1983. So I was 20, I don't know how old I was. <laughs> I was born in 61. I'm terrible at math, but anyway, I, I mean, and I worked, you know, in the bars, I paid my dues. I traveled, I traveled, I sang, I sang, I sang, and I sang. And, um, you know, so in that respect, yes, I worked and I practiced, but it was on stage. It wasn't like I was doing scales or anything at home. Do you still, do you, do you love the performing? Like once you're out there and the crowd, cause I, I know playing, you know, you practice all the time and that's that, you know, you get, 
you get some reward out of practice with your teammates and whatnot, and you're honing your skill, but that crowd being there. And then when you're able to have some success, well, I'm, I'm sure for you singing, singing your songs and what I, I, I enjoyed the performing part, getting out there and, you know, kind of showing my personality a little bit while I played and, you know, what I could give the game. I wonder just what it, what it feels like. And if oh, you still love it that way. Well, yeah. I mean, when I'm, it, I, it's pinnacle. I mean, it is pinnacle of my existence because everything falls aside. You're just a vessel for the natural um, flow of whatever life is, <laughs> you know, like you're just letting life <laughs> go through you and it's all the other stuff. It's the travel, the nervousness, the clothes, the judgment, the reviews, you know, it's all the ex extraneous stuff that wears you down. But being on stage, man, if that's not fulfilling you, then you shouldn't be doing it. But I, I'm, I'm interested because my partner and I were talking about this this morning. Do you think that the players miss the crowds like the NBA misses the crowds? There, in my opinion, no question about it. Yeah. Um, now, I think there there might be some lesser players who enjoy not having the bigger crowds there. Guys who may not play so well on the road uh, against big crowds because the crowds are, you know, they've really been taken out of it. They're starting to come back a little bit. I think those guys, but for the most part, you know, that bubble situation last summer. And I loved watching the bubble. We all did. You know, it yeah. looked great. But those guys were there, especially the ones that were there for so long, more than 100 days, grownups on oh. lockdown, you know, just there, your mental health, all of yeah. that. Stuff. Yeah. Um, and favors, I, the, favors the offense, too, I would yeah, imagine. Absolutely. And I, I just I'm like, um, you because you, you do you play for the crowds, the crowds influence the game, the crowds influence the officiating. Yeah, they, they really do. And yeah. so. Yeah, I think once once you're a professional, you know, the crowds are just they're vital. I, I can only imagine the guys. Yeah, can. because it, because it, and back to the performance thing, because it's a synergy, right? Right. And you're just a part of the action. You're, it's not, you know, you're so feeding off of them. They're feeding, they're off, feeding of off of you. And it's yeah. just this big ball of wax that you're participating in. So the ice is melting and it's crashing. If you <laughs> Uh, you spoke about being, you know, just like a vessel for these things and, and you put it out there. Like, do you feel like when you write a great song uh, that it's it's almost coming from some other place and just coming through you and you're meant to give this to the world or is this obviously it's deep and spiritual for you. But does it ever feel like, you know, this it's just coming through me. Like if you write a song and it's a little easier than others, like here it is. And, and this just exploded through me. Do you, do you ever feel like that if you write a song? <laughs> well, I, I don't really think of myself as a particularly good songwriter and I appreciate your gesture, but um, yeah, I, I think for sure anything creative, um, whether you're in the kitchen or cooking supper or anything creative it's it always feels divine and it always feels like you know a gift from the muse and and that you're you know because really we're just human and that is such a pathetic small <laughs> existence <laughs> and, um, oh i love you to death i <laughs> Josh and I sit and talk about this stuff all the time. We we need to do this off camera at some point. Oh, yeah, I think that we need to have a basketball channel. Because I love talking about the spiritual aspect of basketball. To me, that is everything, like the tenacity, the struggle. the. Let's go. Uh, I mean, I want to be a – I asked uh, – I asked the Stotts is if I could be the spiritual, you know, coach of the Blazers. They didn't take me up on it, but oh, oh, oh. I gotta, I, I gotta. Yeah, ask, with, can you call Neil? Neil with Neil, absolutely, because it, it is. I, I have a son and three daughters, and them growing up, you know, my son played ball, and I just remember he he played because you know he would do the physical things that he saw. But, you know, then he'd get out on the floor and the pointers that I would give him would be, you know, no, you go take the ball from him. 
just take it from him. And I know it's not nice to do, but you start, you know, teaching him the competitive aspect and that you're, you're out there and it's a game of cat and mouse. You fake here and you go here. And there's a whole psychological thing that, that goes on every play of the game. Yeah. Cause I, I, sometimes I'll catch myself watching the game and I go, I wonder if they have existential crisis of just like running up and down and throwing a ball in the net. And like, what would, what would actually perpetuate you to actually want to go through the rigor of what it takes to be doing that? And I'm not unsimilar to getting up on stage and going, really, I have to feel nervous. I feel sick to my stomach. I don't feel attractive. And I have to get up and like turn these people on. And it, and, yeah. and you know, even our, our basic existence is questionable, let alone being an entertainer, which basketball players and singers are. I'm not sure a lot of basketball players think about it on that level. I think uh, CJ <laughs> but does. Maybe, but maybe. I actually do think CJ thinks about that. Oh, yeah. I, I said not many. <laughs> I, do no. think I, do, I do think, though, that basketball and all these sports, it is art. It's a very pure form it is of art. art, you know, an expression. And there's a set of rules and boundaries that they have to play within. And the, the amount of expression and, and, and the, the ballet of it, you know, yes. and the mental, it, it's, I've always explained sports as, as a very pure, pure form of art. I totally, totally agree. You said it uh, earlier, Katie, that, you know, you, by the time you sort of made it, made it, you know, you had worked in the bars and, the, and, done, and you'd had those reps. And so by the time you get to a certain place, you feel like, okay, I'm ready for this next step. It's the same with basketball. You know, yeah. I, I would get nervous before every game thinking about my opponent, sleepless night beforehand, all yeah. of that stuff. But yeah you know, not nearly as nervous as I was in that varsity game as a freshman when in high school, when I had no idea if they were going to, you know, hurt me or <laughs> because they were so much bigger. So it's just hitting those, those little, little thresholds of becoming a pro that. Helped, oh yeah. And know. maintaining the standard that, that, yeah. that is such hard work maintaining like like going and performing at a certain level every night that takes so much internal gumption uh, you know just mm. it takes a lot of luck too and for me I, I i i missed a lot of games and when i think back i was hurt a lot i think it was my mental you know i've had depression and you know just it was difficult for me as a pro athlete to stay on the same even mental keel yeah. all the time. Yeah. And a lot of guys can really do not a lot, but you know, <laughs> you've got three or four or five of them out there in Portland. Yeah. Right now. yeah we do. Career yeah. guys that are, they play the same level every night and then they're not hurt. You know, yeah. CJ, CJ's fought that a little bit the last yeah. couple of years. Mm-hmm. And that's really hard to stay, you know, at your consistent level when you're coming back from an injury, you know, and he's had two or three of them here in the last couple of years. Yeah, and that that again is is this spiritual uh, muscle that you have to apply to yourself that 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 that's bigger than basketball, bigger than a muscle, bigger than than the the reciprocity of the applause or the win of the game. It's it's bigger than that, and it's about uh, you know a kind of a spiritual. Uh, offering that you even have the chance to to do this play basketball or sing playing ball wasn't it, you know it wasn't that difficult the older it got easier the older I got right yeah but my body was breaking down you know yeah. I would, you hit that age and that's when I really started having you know I wasn't as successful having as much success on the floor and man, I would re- I started to go, I went to see a sports psychologist, which was not real cool to do at the time. You didn't want people to hear that, that you were doing that. Really? Wow, that's yeah. So- oh yeah. There's a whole stigma still. It's getting better. Really? It, every team, every team as of a year ago, I believe has to now have a mental health professional on staff used to be, you know, if, if you wanted to talk to somebody, you didn't know if, how much they were sharing with the team. And also, if you needed to go on medication, that was not something for an athlete that, you know, you didn't know if it would dull you at all. 
So you're constantly fighting that. Um, but mm -hmm. it's becoming more, it's becoming, it, we're getting better. And I'm proud of the league because we are the first league who's taken steps to make sure every team has someone on, on, on staff. Man, the NBA just in every respect is just such an organization to be emulated because, you know, how they handle the Black Lives Matter. And oh, it's, I just always appreciate the respect and dignity that they offer the people involved with the teams and the fans. It's, it's something to look up to. It's really nice of you to say. And we, I, I say it, too, because I was so proud this last year. And, I, and I'm always proud. I think we... No, we don't always, the league doesn't always hit the mark, but I'm proud not only for the league and the job that Adam Silver did, but I go back and when I was playing in the eighties and nineties, guys couldn't, they were, if they spoke up on things, guys weren't making enough month, lifetime money to, you know, say something and possibly lose their career. Mm -hmm. And there's really no guarantee that these guys are too. Some of them, you know, that have generational money, fine. But I'm so proud of our league and our players for yeah. standing up and speaking out. Because I, I, there were things that I should have said that I saw in the 80s and 90s, racially, otherwise, that I should have said before now, before being 53 years old. And these guys are in the prime of their athletic careers and doing it. And I couldn't be more proud of them. Yeah, you're here. Yeah. Josh, what's going um, on, Josh? You look pensive. I know he, he gets that way. He does get very pensive. You know, Josh and yeah. I go way back, Katie. Yeah, from how from how long? Well, he he knew me before I knew him. I played basketball at the University of Kentucky, and he grew up in Lexington. So when I was maybe eighteen, he was like a sixteen-year-old sophomore in high school, and he knew me before I did. And then we really didn't meet until like physically or really meet till a decade or so ago. But uh, I lived on his couch after rehab and all that stuff. So we have, we have a real life connection. Hey, and we went, wait, you went through rehab. Was that like after your career? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. I, I, I wasn't a partier, drinker, smoker, uh, anything like that. I really wasn't my whole life. I didn't have my first drink of alcohol till I was like 22, but I, at 32, I had seven surgeries my last three years of playing and a doctor put me on Oxycontin. Oh, right? nice. And within two days, I felt like I was in love and long story, but 14 years, three rehabs and yeah, it took a while. So that must have been hard for you, Josh, to watch your buddy do that. Yeah. You know, I, I, when I met him, I didn't know he was going through these things, you know, and that was, I was just excited. Rex Chapman was my friend. No, but yeah, to see him struggle with it, it what it does is make me so proud now to see where he is and what he's done and how he's risen from that. I, I'm uh, taken aback by it. It's really, Rex, I'm so proud of you, man. Oh, love you, buddy. Thank you. Uh, KD, though, when I was, I got arrested and I was in, in jail <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Yeah, I got arrested and I was in jail and uh, I was out of my mind and didn't know any phone numbers. And um, one of the policemen brought my phone and said, grab a number out of there to call someone. And I opened it up. And there was one message. And I guess the news had already broken that I'd been arrested. And there was a message from Josh saying, I love you, buddy. Whatever you need. No judgment. Just. Yeah. That's awesome. And uh it's awesome. Makes me want to cry every time. Yeah, it makes me want to cry. Friends yeah. are everything, man. Right? Now, you're in Calgary? I am, yeah. Are you living there? I am. Mm -hmm. I Full am. time. Do you have a place anywhere else? Portland. But oh. I haven't been there for the year because the borders are yeah. shut. Are you Are you looking forward to getting back? And oh, I'm games? jonesing oh. so hard to be in those stands. I bet. But... Um, but I'm very, very happy to be here and safe and healthy. Uh, you know, vaccine rollout is super slow here for whatever reason. You um, haven't gotten it yet? No. I, my, my, my parents got it. Josh's parents got it. And, uh, yeah, we're starting to. Yeah. It's pretty exciting. My mom's gotten both of hers, which oh, is good. Great. So, but I can't wait. 
end is the end is in sight somehow. I don't know. Yeah, I think it feels good, uh, doesn't it? Yeah, like, yeah, it really you know, does. Yeah. I don't even like talking, but it's like fingers. You know, I'm scared I'm going to screw it up somehow, and some variant's going <laughs> to some wipe. variant's going to waltz yeah. right in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, that's that's one of the things is that uh, you know the variants are alive and well, so we have yeah. to still be diligent. That's for sure. Absolutely. I'd like some advice from you. Yes, Katie. sir. Um, I you're a vegetarian for long, long time. And it's caused you obviously a lot of problems back home. I, um, I recently became a pescatarian three months. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I don't know, first of all, how long do you go before you can really call yourself that? You know, just be mindful about what you're eating. And if you go, I need this piece of tuna, I need this cod, I'm going to I'm going to think about where it came from. I'm going to thank it. it. It was in service. That's a merit. That's merit that that animal is generating. So by you um, acknowledging and having gratitude to that animal, then then the purpose of that animal's life is fulfilled. So um, I think it's just a matter of just, you know, and even like vegetarians, uh, myself included, we tend to be very self-righteous and, <laughs> and um, we have no reason to, because we're walking down the street, we're killing ants. We're driving down the street, we're killing insects or, you know, when we uh, harvest a crop of rice, we're killing thousands of millions of insects. So we're not free from the causes of suffering. And when that's so just great. People just don't think that you need to worry about it. Just live what you need to do if you want to be vegetarian be vegetarian you don't even need to tell anybody it's easier when did you eat a piece, just, of, fish, eat a piece of fish i could listen to her i could listen yeah, to you talk too. about this uh, when did you uh, at, at what stage in life did you start uh embracing uh buddhism when did you start um I, I find it fascinating and it makes me want to read more and do more. Oh yeah. Well, Buddhism is boy. I, that has been the best thing that's ever happened to me. Um, I, I've always been Buddhist. I've always believed in reincarnation. Um, but I became a practitioner in the 2000 when I met my teacher and took refuge and, um, made my, um, vows and, um, it's just, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's just like, you know, it doesn't matter again, it's spirituality, vegetarian, the same, same. It's, it's, you know, just apply yourself. It's like, they always say, you know, there's a, if you're trying to get to the other side of the river, there's a lot of different boats, just pick one. You can't stand in two different boats and make it across the river, right. you know, just apply yourself, just, just dedicate yourself and believe in what you're doing. Was it ever if someone wanted to, to come start, you know, uh, investigating and uh, Buddhism and start a relationship that way? Or would you, is there a book or something that you would say, here's a great uh, just beginner's it's manual, just like to see if you really dig it or not? Is there one? Yeah, I mean, if we were having a beer and you asked me that question, I would impart that information on you like in no time. But um, in a public realm, I don't know if I would do it because Buddhism is one of the only philosophies that doesn't uh, prophetize. Yes. Fantastic. Because if it's your path, it's your path. Otherwise, forget it. <laughs> it's not going right. to work if I'm sitting here banging it over your head. It's not going to work. Well, let's have a beer after the game. Yes, please. Let's okay. do it in Portland. <laughs> after yeah, the yes. <laughs> yeah, in Portland uh, with Neil. Neil with will Neil, be, Neil yeah. will be up for a beer. Neil's I always met Neil, but I've met his wife and they're great. lovely, and I look forward to to uh, you know digging into my relationships in Portland with you guys. Absolutely. Well, when when you're vaccinated and you make it back down to Portland, Josh, Josh, and I will come up and we'll go catch a game, go grab a beer. Hopefully, it'll be the playoffs this year be in june oh yeah are yeah. you now are you are you looking for are you going to go back out and tour and travel are you done i might be done really yeah i might be done i've been feeling done and i don't want to 
think about it too hard. I don't want to okay. like, I, I may not be done, but right now I feel kind of done. Now you've got the it. Next time you get on an airplane, yeah, I would say just start singing. Maybe maybe you're not done. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna try it. <laughs> I know I would have if I could a do real it. Real shitty experience, Josh. I'm calling you. <laughs> my bad, my bad. Then I don't think you will. I think people will do the old. What's good? What is? Oh my god! <laughs> and then you'll be you'll be right. I'll be like, oh poor pathetic Katie Lang's looking for attention. <laughs> <laughs> no hey way. is there anybody that you because you've you've done it all you've sang with all the people you've done you know uh duets with everyone you've run into so many people and met everyone in hollywood in the world is there someone that you geek out on someone that you're like oh yeah Whoa. there's always people i geek out on it changes i mean it changes every day like i'll hear a song and i'll just be like this is Oh my God, this person's a genius. That's the best song I've ever heard. But it, it, it happens several times a day. Is there a, a specific song maybe that, that you um, hear or that really speaks to you your whole life that you wish that you had written? Uh, oh, again, it happens so several many. times a day. I mean, right. the, my stock answer is happy birthday because I'd, be, <laughs> <laughs> I'd be rolling in the green, but <laughs> yeah, no. Oh my goodness. Katie, thank you so much for coming. Uh, it's I, a pleasure. I, I, I love talking to you guys. I could talk about basketball and life forever and ever and ever. And I hope that, um, I hope that you, you know, that, that our, that our, our, our our ESPN show gets developed soon because then I would have a job and not have to sing. KD on KD. KD on KD, that's right. KD on K on the, the yeah, on KD. <laughs> you guys could have your own show. We we I come do love Kevin back. Durant though. I do love I've always appreciated that. Word. It's hard not to like that yeah, guy. He's just he's a, he's seven he's foot two guard. <laughs> yeah. But we we wanted to have the original KD on first. We'll work on him later. And that that just speaks of your character, right? There. <laughs> <laughs> A.D. Lang, thank you so much. Come back and see you. Nice to talk to you. Nice to meet you. I'm a huge fan, Rex. Keep everybody smiling and laughing and getting pissed. I appreciate that. (laughs) Thank you so much. Much love. Thank you so much, Katie.